Did you ever read something that you didn't understand? Or you thought or or you or you thought you understood, but you really didn't. You really didn't have the full meaning. And then someone comes and they explain to you what that meaning was and then you get a fuller revelation. I mean, I've been there before. Um, it could be a technical thing. It could be a, um, uh, a book. It could be a magazine. It could be an article. It could be something that you didn't understand, that you understood because someone explained it to you more clearly. Well, today we're going to be looking at um, how Jesus was transfigured. Um, the disciples didn't fully understand that. But as Jesus was transfigured, Jesus was going to reveal himself. The Father was going to reveal himself. And, and the truths about Jesus and what would happen would be revealed. We're going to be looking at uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. So read along with me um, as I read the scripture. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And he appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they, had bec for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. <clears throat> Listen to him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. And they were coming down from the mountain, and he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. Then they seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written, written, just as it is written of him. We're going to be looking at three specific points here today. The kingdom of God comes with power, Jesus transfigured, and Elijah must come first. So let's get into our passage this morning, and let's look at our first point here. It says, the kingdom of God come, comes with power. Jesus said to his disciples, there are some who won't taste death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, those are one of those statements that, what does that mean? What is that, what is he saying there? What is he saying there? Of course, Jesus said a lot of things that his disciples didn't understand at the time, at the moment. But what Jesus was saying to his disciples were that they're saying that there's some things that are going to be coming. What did he talk about in the prior passage before? That he was going to suffer. So he was beginning to do what? He was beginning to reveal what was to come. What was to come? What would be those things that would be coming down the road. What are you to expect? Now, they don't understand those things, and they, don't fully, uh, they couldn't fully comprehend those things. But Jesus was saying, now, he spoke about that. He spoke about his death and how he would be suffer, and then he would rise again. 
What did all that all mean? But now, right after that, on the heels of that, he comes and says, there are some of you who won't taste death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. It's interesting. Because after Jesus rose, what happened 40 days later? Pentecost, didn't it? And what came with power? The Holy Spirit came with power, didn't it? See, what Jesus was doing was, Jesus was revealing to his disciples what would come. He prepared them last week, as we were seeing in that previous passage, and now he's preparing them even, even further for what will happen, what will take place in the days to come once he is gone, once he has that he, he was crucified once he was once he was dead and then once he's risen then there's going to come a time where you're going to receive the king you're going to see the kingdom of god what's the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is jesus as king coming in power coming in the presence of his people the church what is the church the church is god's kingdom here on earth it displaying his kingdom here on earth through his people and through his works and through his miracles and through uh, the things that he says and through the things that he does through whom through his people empowered with what from the holy spirit what happened at pentecost what happened at um in the upper room uh when they were all disciples met the holy spirit came down didn't it and they were endued with what? Power. So the kingdom of God, once Jesus was gone, after Jesus was raised, and the kingdom of God came with power, the power came through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was going to enable the church to live and to work um, as God's kingdom here on earth. And see, Jesus was trying to reveal that to them. Now it says here, it says, some of you won't taste death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. Well, was everyone going to see that? Who was, in that? who was in that group? Who was among the apostles there that wasn't, wasn't going to make it to Pentecost? Of course, it was Judas. Because he betrayed Jesus, Jesus, and after he betrayed him, he hung himself. So he wasn't going to see that. So Jesus knew all that. Jesus knew and Jesus was aware that Judas would take his own life. He knew all that. And he knew he wouldn't see the kingdom of God. So that's why he says, it says, it says that there are some of you who won't taste death until they see the kingdom of God come, power, come with power. So he knew that Judas would be gone. That's why he couldn't say all of you. But see, Jesus knows the plan. Jesus knows the purpose. And Jesus reveals his plan and reveals his purpose to his disciples. It wasn't completely clear at this time how that was all going to happen, but at the same time, he was giving a, um, a revelation of what would happen when those things would come. So Jesus is always, and this is something that we need to be aware of as his people, Jesus is always revealing his purpose and his plan to us as his people. And we need to be aware and we need to be cognizant and we need to listen and hear what he's saying, how he's saying it, what's going on, what is going to happen, what is going to, what are the things that Jesus wants to do. This was monumental as far as his plans. His disciples had experienced a lot of teaching under Jesus. They had seen a lot of miracles under Jesus. But Jesus knew that he was, he, his time was coming to an end uh, on earth. And so he was going to be, he was going to be, suffer. He was going to die. He was going to rise again. And he, was going to, and he was going to go back into heaven with his heavenly father. And the disciples would be left behind. 
in order to take over the work that Jesus had begun. And so that's what the purpose of him was preparing. So all of a sudden it didn't happen that what happened? Jesus had, we never knew this was going to happen. Well, that's why Jesus said, you know what? This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to this is and this is how it's going to happen. And we Jesus does the same thing with us as well. He reveals things to us so that we can be prepared in order for when those things happen. We may not fully understand it, but he will explain it along the way. Right? He'll explain it along the way, but we have to what? We have to listen, not only with these, but with this as well. Because he has a purpose in mind. He already knows, um, like for example, if you look at uh, Psalm 139, it talks about how God knows us individually. It says that I knew you while you were at, yet in your mother's womb and the, uh, the days that were numbered for you before there was yet even one. So in other words, he knows the days that are for us, that are given to us, and what is going to happen and what will transpire transpire during those days and so as we become believers he reveals his plans and he reveals those purposes and he reveals those things that will come in order for us to understand what will come he doesn't reveal everything all at once otherwise we would become overwhelmed wouldn't we but he reveals things in pieces and he reveals things in time in the appropriate time Everything, it says, as it says in Ecclesiastes, everything, there's a time and purpose for everything under heaven. So he reveals things in their appropriate time. Me, we, we may want to know things right now at this moment, but he may, right now might not be that moment. And he may reveal things before we even expect it, and it's the appropriate moment. But he wants us to be aware, and this is what's really key important. We have to hear. We have to listen. We have to be in tune with what he's saying. That comes through prayer. That comes through um, uh, meditation in the word, reading the word, memorizing the word. Listening to what he's saying. Whether it's through a minister preaching, whether it's through um, a, a gospel song, whether it's through... Um, that's still small voice or whether it's through a loud voice. God is always speaking, but he wants us to hear and he wants to reveal his plan to us. We're saying, well, I can't, how can I hear specifically? Well, we can, because the more we hear and the more we're willing to hear, the clearer his voice becomes. But the less, the less he's speaking, but the less we hear, and the less we're willing to hear what he has to say, his voice becomes duller. And therefore, we don't know. We don't know what those steps are that he's going to reveal to us in the days to come ahead. And that's why it's very clear, folks. That's why it's so very important. Keep your ears and your hearts open to what he's saying. Okay, let's go on to our next point. Jesus is transfigured. So... Jesus took Peter, James, and John to a high mountain where he was transfigured before them. Who were Peter, James, and John? James and John were brothers, the sons of, th sons of thunder. right? That's what Jesus called them. Because they, they had a little bit of an edge to them, a little bit of, possibly a little bit of a temper to them. And then there was Peter. The, uh, the perpetual... One who always spoke too soon. Right? But these were the ones that Jesus was going to be heading as the, as the head of the church that was going to come. Isn't it interesting? Again, Jesus has a plan, doesn't he? He has a purpose that he wants to accomplish. And he wants to accomplish. Remember I talked about how Jesus was going to talk about his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. And he's going to say, you're going to be clothed with power on high, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember? I was talking about that. Then, now, six days later, he takes 
those whom he deemed the closest ones to him were the ones who were going to oversee the church, the ones who were going to oversee the work that God had for them that was going to come. Because these three and the other apostles as well were going to be integral parts of what God was going to do. So God was going to do what? He was going to reveal his plan and his purpose to them. Albeit in a, in a, in a, in a, in a highly unusual way. I'm sure the disciples didn't see that coming, that Peter, James, and John didn't see that coming. Why is Jesus taking up the mountain? What's going, on, what's going on here? I'm sure that went through their mind. I'm sure they were figuring, well, Jesus is going to do something. But he chose them because they were the ones who were going to be lead the church, folks. It's important to remember. He chooses us because there's a specific reason and purpose that he wants to accomplish through us. He chose Peter, James, and John to witness what they were going to witness for a specific reason that he wanted to accomplish through them. When he reveals to us something it's for a specific reason and purpose that he wants to reveal through us, that he wants to use us through. Yes, he wants to use little old John Williams. Yes, he wants to use each one of us for a specific reason and purpose that he has planned out for us in his church. What does God, what does God say in, uh, in Jeremiah 29, 11? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Does God know his plans for us? Absolutely he knows his plans for us. He's got a purpose behind it that he wants to accomplish. And each one of you he wants to accomplish. But we have to hear, but we have to be aware, and but we have to know, okay, God, I hear what you're saying. I don't understand it. I know that you'll make it clear to me, but I want to hear it, God. I want to receive it. Okay? And he was transfigured before him. What does that mean, transfigured? Wow. Meaning that he was changed. His appearance was changed. So Jesus, when he was up there on this high mountain, his appearance became different. It became different from what they were accustomed to. It wasn't look like anything that they had ever seen Jesus in before. And what had happened, and it says, okay, and got, garments became exceedingly white. In other words, the whitest white that you could ever see. The brightest white, brighter than any launderer could ever get them. With more bleach than ever you could have ever gotten them bright. So in other words, it was like so bright that you, like almost, you, you couldn't even barely look at it. But that's how, that's, and his garments became, came like that. And that was the first part. So how do you think the disciples reacted to that? Here Jesus is transfigured. Here his presence was changed before them. And the white garments, and what do you think the white garments indicate? The white garments indicate a heavenly garment. Purity. Without without blemish, without any spot on it. Not dull, not gray, but bright white. Purity, the holiness of heaven. Look at that, think about that. And that's what they saw Jesus in. They saw Jesus for who he was. God's son dressed in the holy garment of heaven. Pretty powerful, isn't it? So they're starting to see Jesus as what? As something different than what they're accustomed to. Right? They're starting to see Jesus as whom? As for who he really is. What was the big question that day? I mean, in the day, in, the, in that day, not that specific day, um, date, um, but I'm saying in that day, in other words, in that time period, what were they looking for? 
What had they been looking for for centuries? They've been looking for the Messiah, hadn't they? Especially during this time, too, they were looking at it because they had Roman oppression, right? Roman oppression had them under under duress, under uh, and they constraint, and they had them literally like under their foot, and they were oppressing them and hurting them and and depriving them and and treating them harshly, and they wanted to get out from underneath that oppression. So the Messiah was the one who was supposed to do it. So they look at Jesus and his clothes. I say, wow. Then, what does it say here? I'm, it says here, his garments became seen white. Mo Elijah and Moses appear to them and they're talking with Jesus. Elijah and Moses, who were they? Moses was what? The writer of what? the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and what? Deuteronomy, the law. The one who delivered them from the cruel hands of the Egyptians. Right? It's interesting. And the one whom passed away, but they never found his body because he had went and be with God. Because he never found his body. And then the other one was what? Elijah. Right? Because who buried Moses? God did. So he never knew where he was buried. Then what happened with Elijah? Who was Elijah? Elijah was perhaps one of the, the great prophets. One of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. He did miraculous wonders. Spoke boldly for the Lord. Spoke boldly for God. But then he was done, done what? He was taken up in a chariot into what? Heaven. He never died. So two unusual circumstances for individuals. The, God buried Moses. And Elijah never died. He was taken up in a chariot of fire into heaven. Interesting, isn't that? But here they are. Moses who was considered a prophet as well, and Elijah, who was considered a prophet. And Jesus' garments are changed. And remember, Peter, James, and John are witnessing this. And remember, what were people looking for on that day? They were looking for the Messiah, weren't they? What did Moses talk about? He talked about the coming of the promised one. Elijah did as well as all the other prophets had spoken about the coming of the Messiah. And now Peter, James, and John are seeing the fulfillment, the heavenly fulfillment, the validation of what? The Messiah. The promised one. Not an earthly king, but a heavenly one. A heavenly one. And what were they doing? They were discussing what? And they, um, and they were discussing, and they were talking with Jesus. We don't know specifically what they were talking about, but we could assume that they were talking about Jesus' impending suffering, his death, and his resurrection. So that's what they were probably, we don't know for sure, but we could surmise that that's what they were talking about. Because what, Je what had Jesus been talking to his disciples about? Talking about his suffering, his, res his, his death, his resurrection, and the power that was to come on high. So they were preparing, they were talking with Jesus. Talking about something, we're not sure, but we, I could, we could surmise probably it was, that's what he was talking about. Jesus was going to be coming. He was going to, what was going to be happening in the next you know, the coming days. So, remember though, Peter, James, and John are witnessing all this, aren't they? Again, think about us. 
Have we ever seen Jesus transfigured? We've had a transfiguring moment in our lives where we've seen Jesus and the light for who he is, for where he really is. I have, I think we all have. But there comes a moment in each of our lives where we have that transfiguration moment or moments where we see Jesus for who he truly, really is. The heavenly Messiah, the heavenly God, the heavenly King, whose kingdom was going to come to earth with power, who's going to endow us with power, and is going to lead us as his king. And we get that revelation in our hearts, and then that what happens after that point in our lives? We're not the same, folks. We're not the same. God has a plan. He has a purpose for us. That he wants us to see and he wants us to understand. But he wants to accomplish it through us. But he gives us, sometimes he gives us those heavenly revelations. A transfiguration, so to speak that experience of seeing Jesus for who he is and that makes the difference in our life and our walk and we're not the same again. We're not. Because what, and sometimes we need those moments because what's going to come next in our lives and the purposes that are going to come in us are going to, we're going to need to have a deeper revelation of Jesus in order to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish in our lives after that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I know some of this stuff may seem a little deep, but the reality is that sometimes we need that revelation of Jesus, a deeper revelation of Jesus and who he is in order to accomplish those next steps that he wants to take us in our lives. The apostles, the, Peter, James, and John did, didn't they? They did. Because they were going to lead the church and they were going to lead the church for all, for the coming days. And they needed that. God's got a purpose through us. If sometimes we need that revelation, that transfiguration of who he is and all his glory and all his beauty in order to accomplish the next steps in our lives. Does that make sense? Because those are things that God wants to accomplish in and through us. Not just personally, but for his church as well. Because God, we're just God's not we're not just here for us and to make us happy and to make us well. Yes, he wants us to be happy, and he wants us to be well, and he wants us to have joy in our hearts. But it's also for his church. Not this church building, not just for Crescent Bible Church, but for the church worldwide, for the church universal. Because we're an integral part of that church. We're an integral part of what God wants to do and what God wants to accomplish. And, and we need that deeper revelation, but he wants to accomplish through each one of us, individually and corporately. And we need to ask ourselves the question, are we ready to receive that? Are we ready to receive that re deeper revelation of Christ? Are we ready to receive what's going to come next? Or we don't understand. Well, it might be hard. Well, Jesus, you're going to suffer. You're going to die. You're going to rise. I don't know if I can handle that. I don't know if I'm ready for that. You're going to see power from on high. Well, what does it all mean? That sounds kind of spooky and like, I don't know if I can handle that. I don't agree with that. Theologically, I wasn't taught that way. I'm not going to receive that. I'm not going to accept that. We have to get past our theological barriers, our presuppositions, our fears, our doubts, our things that people have told us, our traditions, those things that hold us back from receiving from God what he wants us to receive and to what he wants us to do. And we have to get past it. And the older we get, the more barriers we put up and the more things we hold on to and the more resistant we are to what God wants to do. 
But we have to be willing as God's people. If we want to see the kingdom of God come with power in our, in our lives today, we're going to need to let go of those things so God can reveal what he wants to reveal to us so when God wants to accomplish in and through us in our day and our time. Because aren't we a needy time, aren't we? We're in a needy time. Probably, well, probably every time in history has been needy. But it seems like this time in history has been the neediest. Right? People are resisting God. People are turning and doing things that are terrible. People are mean to each other. People don't like each other sometimes. People do some terrible things to each other. We live in a culture and society where it seems unbearable sometimes. But God, God has a purpose in all of this, but God wants to use us in the midst of all that, doesn't he? He wants to use little old John Williams. He wants to use me. He wants to use you, each one of us. He's given us each gifts, guys. Each of us has specific gifts that he wants to use in and through us. Well, I don't have, I'm not smart enough. I'm not charismatic enough. I don't have enough wealth. I don't have enough power. I don't have enough intellect. I don't have enough strength, ability. I'm handicapped. I'm this. I'm that. Stop making excuses. God made us the way we are. And there's a purpose and a reason for us the way he made us so he can accomplish what he wants to accomplish in and through us. We don't have the money that Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos has. So what? God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We may not have the intellect of uh, Albert Einstein. We may not have the physical, uh, uh, physical abilities of a Michael Jordan or another player. We may not own all these things, but who owns us? And who owns all those other things? And who endows and who gifts all those things? Who? Right? So we can't make excuses, can we? He used a bunch of fishermen that were uneducated to change the world, didn't he? Were James and John perfect? They were angry men. Sometimes they lost their temper and they got upset. But God saw, God had a purpose and plan for them that he chose to use them. Peter had a habit of using, getting, speaking too quickly before he, before he was supposed to. He would speak and say stuff rashly without thinking about it first. Got him in trouble a couple times. But the reality was that they were the ones that God chose because he knew that he wanted to accomplish something in and through them. Are we each one of us perfect? No. I got tons of flaws. I got tons of things in my life that I'm still working through by God's grace and by God's power. But does he want to use me? Absolutely. Does he want to use you? Absolutely. Each one of us. But let's go on here. And, and the cloud forms overshadowing them. Now, not only did he see him speaking to Elijah and Moses, Two of the top figures in the Old Testament, right? You think about it. Then they see a cloud coming. Here comes this cloud. And it settles down. Hmm. Where have we seen a cloud before? Where have we heard a cloud before? Had to do with Moses. What, did we, what happened when they were in the desert? when they were told to move. Pillar of fire by night, and a what? A cloud by what? Day. So the cloud was what for what? Was to tell them, okay, the, it, the cloud, okay, this is time to go now. Pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. When the cloud was lifted, it was time to go. Same thing with the pillar of fire at night. So here it is, the cloud by day, and here what, and this is my, and a voice comes from the cloud. Could you imagine this voice? 
a voice coming from the clouds. They didn't have electronics back then, folks, so if, but if they couldn't fake it. Somebody couldn't fake audio there. Right? Some people, you know how you could do that, to, probably could do that today. Somehow you could probably finagle a way to, to uh, get a, a voice to come out. But they didn't have all those electronics today that we have today and the technology. And it says, this is what? This is my... Imagine the tone of this voice. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Who's that speaking? God. You, we heard that statement before. It says, um, this was years and years ago, so I'm dating myself. It was a commercial. It says, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Right? A financial firm. When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, when God speaks, people listen. Right? This voice wasn't a financial firm. This voice was the voice of God. The verbal voice of God coming from the cloud. So who got to hear the verbal voice of God? Peter, James, and John did. And so we see here that God the Father, this is my, whose son? My son. So God is speaking, saying, my son in whom with what? I am what? Well pleased. His beloved son in whom he's well pleased. God in his mercy and his miraculous way was revealing his son to Peter, James, and John. What? For the purpose of validating who he was as the Messiah, the promised one. You want, you need further validation? Well, this is the validation I'm giving you. Peter, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. God's saying, listen to my son. You want to hear me? You hear my son. You want to listen to me? You listen to my son. When God speaks, we need to listen, we need to hear clearly, and we need to understand and know who Jesus is. He's God's Son, come in the flesh for a plan and for a purpose that he wants to use and accomplish in and through us. Let's finish up with our last point here. Elijah must come first. Verses 9 through 13. And Jesus said to him, um, do not relate this to anyone. There was a purpose. Jesus sometimes tells us things that we don't understand for a reason, for a purpose. But we have to trust him to do or not to do what he tells us not to do. And there was a reason and a purpose here. Because people weren't going to understand what they just saw, that they just experienced, until after Jesus rose from the dead. Then people would have a better understanding of it. And they were discussing with one another, verse 10, what rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, saying, what is it, why is it described say that Elijah must come first? Well, if you, I, I don't have time to look at this right now, but you look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It prophesies that what? That, this, that Elijah must come first and restore all things. Okay, so what does that all mean? Malachi 4, 5. And talking about, well, who was the forerunner of Jesus? Who came before Jesus? Who introduced Jesus? Who did? John the Baptist. Was John the Baptist Elijah? He was John the Baptist. He was an individual person, but he came in the spirit and the power what? of Elijah as the forerunner to Jesus. And he says, um, 
and, di and Elijah must come first, and yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? So it predicts that Elijah will come first, which was a fulfillment, but then it also talks about how the Son of Man will suffer. So fulfillment, again, of Scripture. God's plan, God's fulfillment of Scripture will always happen. God's plan will always come about, folks. God's plan and purpose will always be fulfilled. It will always will. What God says, he will do. And we have to trust him for it, even though we don't understand. If God says something, it's going to happen. What God says in his Old Testament has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. What God says in the New Testament has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. Right? It's going to happen. It's just not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. And it may not happen the way that we understand or the way we've, we, we can comprehend. But it will happen. And we know that. And the folks, I, and this I think is a, clear, a real important point. And it says here, and they say to you, Elijah did indeed come, verse 13, and they did to him whatever they wished. Not only did they do to Jesus what they, did, what they was going to do, but they did to Elijah. What did they do to John the Baptist? Herod had his what? Head cut off, right? They did to him whatever they wanted. They did it to Elijah. Well, they, 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 mis they mistreated John, and John was what? And John was beheaded because he spoke out at the Herod. Again, what God says will happen and what he says will be accomplished in his way and his time. And we have to trust him that what his word says will happen. What his word says is going to be accomplished and will be completed, folks. It will be completed. Trust and know God for that. To sum everything up, folks, is that God speaks things. He prepares things. He gives us hints to things. It may not be as clear as we would like to, but he does it in its time and in its place. And it'll real, real things in an appropriate time. But we have to trust him that he knows what he's doing. Because he's got a, as he had a plan for Peter, James, and John, so he has a plan for us and for his church now. As he got, God allowed them to experience the transfiguration of Jesus, allowed them to hear the voice of God, the voice of the Father, and listen to the voice and validation of who Jesus is and what he is about, so he will allow us to get that validation. He will allow us to have those transfiguration experiences in our lives to prepare us for a purpose and a reason that will come. And know that when God says things and when God has things happen and he reveals it in the Old Testament or in the New Testament and he reveals them, those things will be accomplished. Know that those things will be accomplished and those things will come about and those things will happen. But we have to trust God that what he says will happen. Believe God. Hear God. Receive from God and do those things that God wants you to do in order to be the person that he wants you to be and accomplish what he wants you to accomplish. So this world can be a better place because you have listened to Jesus and that your church, you're a part of what God is doing here in his church. Again, there's no position, there's no person too small or too large that God can't use in order to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And, what, and again, I'll close with the verse and in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you what? A future and a hope. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you, Almighty God, for your word, uh, your word that brings life, your word that brings truth, your word that brings hope your word that brings um, fulfillment in our lives. And Jesus, we ask, oh God, even right now, that you would help us to receive from you, help us to understand from you, help us to 
um, accept those things that you want from us in our lives. Show us, help us to have those transfiguration experiences, God, so that we can see that deeper revelation of you and who you are. Fulfill your purpose in us. Fulfill your plan in us. Please, oh God, we pray. Please show us mercy when we haven't listened, and please help us to listen um, as we go forward, oh God, we pray. Bind the hand of the enemy in our lives. Be thou exalted, be thou honored, and all that's done and all that's said in us, oh God, we pray. And Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your mercy in us and what you're doing in our lives. And we love you, God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Fathers, dismiss your people now with your peace, with your joy, with your very presence, we pray. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.